Um, let me review a little bit, as always. And I want to point this out. I'm going to, I'm going to do a quick review, but here's my stipulation. You really ought to be able to do this at this point without, without really much thought. And so what, what I'm doing is changing you. And um, I, I know I've been doing this 15 years, but you should be able to do this relatively easily, too. Changing you is work. I'll always start with work because P minus PDV, that's stuck in my head pretty good. And hopefully for you at this point. Now remember that heat, that's work. Heat is now TDS. Okay, all derivations will start with this. When you say, hey, what's the change in you with respect to whatever, then you're doing this. Okay, now enthalpy is H, uh, H is U plus PV. Now I'm not going to do the derivation. Now here's my point. Given this, you should be able to do what I'm going to write down right now which is that uh, H is still, um, I mean, I'm going to start with TDS plus VDP. Okay, you should be able to, to get that out. Now, that, there's a derivation to do that. Don't memorize this. There's a derivation behind that. You should be able to do it. Uh, and if not, you don't even know what I'm talking about, that's not good. <coughs> you're, you're, you're in a lot of trouble if, if you're not sure how I go from here to here. Um, you're, you're deficient on a lot of grounds if you're not sure how I get from here to here. Uh, see me in office hours, you're not screwed, but you have to do something if you're not sure where I came up with that. Okay, likewise for A, there's A, the change in A, and I've got, again, you can see I've got these memorized. Um, sure, but um, again, you should be able to do this. There's A, and G is the ultimate uh, Legendre tra transform. You take U and subtract out TS and PV, and that's H minus TS. I'll pick whichever one of these is convenient, and then VG is, I have to think about it, SDT plus VDP. Okay, so U is a function of V and S, H is a function of P and S, uh, A is a function of V and T, and G is a function of P and T. Um, now remember that, uh, maybe, again, I know a lot of you skipped out in the extra hour and I had to continue lecture a little bit so that you could do your homework. And again, it's, it's meshed into the video, um, so watch that if you didn't see it. Um, Maxwell relations, Maxwell relations are necessary tools of about half the derivations that are on your homework. And guess what? Wink, wink on the test. And um, it's from Euler's test. Euler's test for exactness. Again, watch the video, but I'm just going to very quickly go over how you do this. Um, I can't review the entire lecture, but what you do is there's a little pattern to how to get Maxwell relations. Maxwell relations are just tools for derivations, essentially. You really don't have a better explanation. So what I do is I remember that is the change in what is equal to the change in what. That's what a Maxwell relation is. And uh, again, there's a formal derivation based on Euler's test. If I ask you to derive a Maxwell relation on the exam, I would want you to start out with the Euler test. Did I say Euler? The Euler, Euler's test, and then substitute from there. But there's a little mnemonic, a little pattern to this, which is we'll start with P, S, V. So D, P, S at constant V. Again, P, S, V. And then T, V, sorry, T, V, S. And there's no negatives, T, V, constant S. And again, on your homework, you will see, or, or in the extra hour, the, again, which is on, the, on YouTube, you'll see how these are useful. Um, now that I know this pattern, I can, I can do these kind of quick. Uh, T, P, a constant S. And by the way, on the, uh, on the cheat sheet for the second exam, uh, you've got these specified. These are spelled out, unless I ask you to derive them, but maybe that's how you know I'm going to do that when I give you the cheat sheet. Uh, DVDS, S at constant P. Uh, I'll just do this one very quickly. Um, all the negatives, the negatives will all cancel. So that's uh, S, V at constant P is PT constant V. Now, the ones from A and G are special because um, 
The, the PDT at constant V is very easy with the perfect gas law. Also, I may ask you to throw in uh, um, Van der Waals equation instead. Again, that's also on the homework. And let's see, the one based on G, there's four of these. Because there's four energy equations, okay? I pick up a negative in this one. S, P, constant T. And again, I get a friendly dV, dT, which is very simple, and constant P. Perfect gas law, that's NR over P. Anyway, okay, again, by themselves, they're a little cross-eyed, like what, what the heck do I do with these? Um, well, here, we can do this one, uh, NR over V. And therefore, what I can do with this is, uh, maybe I ask you to derive this, and I can then ask you for how is it useful. You can separate the S and V as follows, N R over V, D V, and what you get from this is the equation for the change in system entropy, which, again, hopefully this is familiar to you because we've seen this a bunch and you had to do it on your homework. So anyway, as I mentioned before, when it comes to a lot of these entropy derivations, there's always multiple ways to do them, and maybe you recall how we did it in class, we actually used we substituted work for heat. Oh, anyway, watch the video if you don't remember how we did this before. There's multiple ways to do this, and this is one of them. Um, now, again, hopefully this is all not too bad. I know that sometimes maybe you get a little cross-eyed with just so many freaking letters that we have. That's fine, because you can just kind of take your time and work through it. If you have no idea what I'm, what I'm doing, mega bad at this point. So, okay, I won't hark on that any further. Uh, now, another thing I wanted to mention was at the end of the last lecture, I did make a big mistake where I said, uh, the, the last thing you, you need to know about G and A, G and A are not very complicated, uh, particularly. Uh, now that we, you're used to all this, the U, D, T, it's constant, la, 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 la. Uh, the only things I mentioned were, of course, um, how... Uh, let's see, change in A, let's, now let's, let's start holding uh, things constant and constant T. Uh, the change in A is minus PDV, which is reversible work. I've gotten a couple of emails over the weekend. Uh, on your homework, you have um, questions one and two, which are the magic cylinder, gas expands and gas contracts. Those are isothermal. And what you end up with is for the change in A, uh, this is isothermal because it is a constant T, so this term is gone, minus PDV, and that's reversible work. Now, here's the thing. For the reversible, so questions one and two, they're both isothermal. One's reversible, one's irreversible. For the reversible question, there you go. What about the irreversible? What do you think? Is it work? It's work, right? It is work, but which one? It doesn't matter. It does, yeah, it kind of actually does because those are not the same number. So which one would you count for, for change in A? Now again, change in A is reversible work, and in the reversible question, it's a no-brainer. What about the question with irreversible gas expands, gas contracts? What do you, have, what do you do? What do you do? It should be the same. It still worked, but you got two works, and that's really in your face in the irreversible one. What do you think? Reversible or irreversible? Eh? Wait, 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 wait. If it's path independent, it doesn't matter. Therefore, it's the... It's the reversible. It's what I just wrote. It doesn't change, right? It never changes. Even It doesn't matter how the process occurred. When you do state changes in state variables, once you derive something for it, it's absolute. It always works, it's always right. So, uh, gas expands, gas contracts, it's isothermal, what's the change in A? You do the reversible work. Even if it's irreversible, you actually have to, you know, this is what's kind of sucky, this is where you'll make a mistake. You calculate the irreversible work, which will be less negative than the reversible, and then you just insert that number for change in A. And that's wrong, right? You have to calculate the work twice in the irreversible questions. I'm going to ask you for the work, so you calculate the irreversible work, but then you have to do it again as though it was reversible. Okay, so that's actually all I've got. Uh, so remember, uh, if we're at constant T and constant volume, then the change in A represents the change in total entropy. 
the uh, um, clouds use inequality. Don't forget that stuff. Okay, change in G. Now this one's kind of neat. We're going to do this at constant T as well. Okay, now this is kind of funky. At constant T, you can see that G is um, VDP. Okay, but that's a bear to calculate in your questions, especially if volume is a constant. Uh, there's this little crazy trick. This is really odd, but watch this. And, and I don't really understand this too well, but I'm going to use the DH form of uh, DG uh, minus uh, TS. Okay, so this is kind of neat. CPDT, and again, H is exact, so it can always use CPDT to calculate the change in H. Uh, by the way, the change in H is isothermal, so it's zero already. So uh, um, I'm doing perfect gas, by the way. Um, so that's zero. Okay, minus TDS minus SDT. Okay, we're isothermal, so that's zero. And yes, I should be using units. Let me add units. Now I'm going to set it by dough. Okay, there we go. Okay. It's minus TDS, which is minus, minus the heat, reversible heat, which is equal to the reversible work, which is minus PDP. Okay. So here's the damnedest thing. Gas expands and gas contracts. It's isothermal. Give me S, U, H, A, G, C, D, Z, blah, blah, blah. A and G. A, again, reversible work. G, reversible work. They're both reversible work. So there you go. So that's it. All right. Now, with that, remember that I'm kind of thinking about one of the hard questions, the, what did I call it, the wings would have an arrow sauce, the two hard questions. I'm probably going to throw away a gas expands and gas contracts. Give me N, C, D, P, e, P, e, you know, H, U, A, G. Give me, you know, all, what do we have? What did I say, 12 variables and four, anyway, yeah. Anyway, there's a bunch of them. Now, here's a neat thing, um, and I don't really quite, I mean, I guess I understand it, but this has always been a little mind-numbing. When you want to do adiabatic, adiabatic, which means the change in system entropy is zero, and again, I'll put units down. You actually run into this crazy problem. This is really so weird. Um, let's do change in G. I think this is the easy one. Uh, okay, so you got CP, DT. Okay, now, adiabatic, remember that you always calculate the change in T first. Hopefully that's also drilled in your head, especially after having to do that irreversible. Remember how you, I had you do an irreversible um, adiabatic question on the last homework? I'm not going to ask that again. I'm not going to do any more adiabatic uh, irreversible because those are nightmares. It should be easy, but they're not. Okay. Anyway, you calculate the change in T. Okay, now this term is gone. So you got this. So the change in G is, uh, is just CP uh, minus S DT. Okay, so there you go. Uh, yeah, actually, maybe I, I see you guys writing things down. Maybe, maybe you actually don't want to, uh, because here's a little bit of the trick. Uh, if you want to get delta G, you integrate DG, get delta G. Okay, this gets kind of funky. Um, you got to integrate this. You got to integrate this. And note that CP and S are actually both temperature dependent. So this, unfortunately, can get really complicated. You, you need a computer to do it. Uh, it it's perfectly calculatable. Um, what you can do is assume that heat capacity, we've often been assuming heat capacity is temperature independent. You actually could do that in this one, too, because you're adiabatic and the system entropy is, is, is not changing. Um, so this actually isn't that bad. But what then I also have to do is I have to tell you what's in the cylinder. It's like nitrogen gas, and I have to give you its entropy. And we're going to cover what the entropies of things are, how, how you calculate that. I, I've already mentioned to you it's KLN number of microstates. Way complicated. There's easier ways to do it, which we're covering today. But here's my point. This is doable for adiabatic reversible. And adiabatic irreversible is basically impossible. So we're just not going to be doing adiabatic adiabatic DGs and DAs, we just don't do them. Uh, and they're not really important anyway. I mean, why do you want to know any of these energies? You want to know them 
to know if they're negative if the right conditions are, are in place, you know, constant T, constant V, because then that's total entropy. Now again, let me say that again. These guys are useful under certain conditions. The, the U, H, A, and G. They're useful under certain conditions. Those conditions are always when their natural variables are held constant. Then they can either turn into heat, that's U and H, or work, that's A and G. Or if both variables are held constant, then they tell you the total entropy. Those are why we want to know them. A and G are not useful in adiabatic conditions because they're not functions of S. S is not their natural variable. And that means I, never, I don't care what A and G are. I mean, yeah, I guess I can calculate it if I tell you that it's nitrogen gas, what the entropy is, um, and that's for adiabatic reversible and adiabatic irreversible. I really don't know what you do. If you need a computer. Why am I doing any of this? It, it doesn't matter because A and G are not functions of entropy. That information is useless. It doesn't tell you anything. just doesn't tell you anything. So we're not going to do that. Anyway. With that, I'm actually still reviewing, and I've reviewed kind of way too long. Uh, let's get into, there's a final nuance about, so this is new material. Well, I don't think I mentioned this last time. You know, sometimes I don't mention this just because what I end up doing is I just don't ever ask adiabatic questions with G and A in them. That's kind of how I've done it in the past with some classes if I think the class was a little bit cross-eyed and having problems following. Um, with you guys, I, I think you're up to speed, so I'm just, I'm just mentioning to you that's why you're not going to see that. Okay, other stuff is uh, delta G. Okay, delta G's got some nuances, and I want to also state that from here on out, um, so we're about to cross into the land of chemical reactions. Uh, from now on, we're going to do T and P constant. Um, as we're going to, uh, I, I'm just about five minutes away from getting into chapter six. At chapter six, T and P are always constant. Again, we're doing chemical reactions. Chemical reactions uh, in, in the earth, as, as I've said many, many times, and God knows if you read the textbook, it, it says it many, many more times, the earth is an isothermal constant pressure system because the earth is not encapsulated by a giant metal box, and I know the seasons change. I know that chemical reactions can get hot. But for the most part, we tend to keep things in a heat bath. And again, we, we tend not to do things in enclosed vessels because those are dangerous. And if you do put them in an enclosed vessel, be very careful. Right. So uh, regardless, from now on, temperature and pressure will be constant. Now that means that delta G is total entropy. Now, total entropy times minus T, right? That way, total entropy going up Minus T means delta G goes down. But I'm going to express it as though delta G is total entropy. Nuances, right? Nuances. So just be aware of that. Now with that, I'm only going to care about G from now on. Even though we, we've just basically introduced this, uh, is everything in this class is going to be about delta G from now on. So um, anyway, let's get into that. Uh, uh, let me write this thing down. I just wrote it down. And... Um, Again, you should be able to derive this. It's not, you know, I probably will have this on the cheat sheet, but it, as I said many times, um, it's like how I have, I have calc identities on the cheat sheet, but if you don't know any calc, it's like the answer to the question in a foreign language. I mean, there's the answer it's right in front of you, but if you don't speak the language, it's useless. So um, anyway, I'm sure this is on the cheat sheet, but if you don't know what it is, then it's, it's useless. Uh, what do I want to say about it? Okay. Now, this is kind of important. Um, all right, we're in constant, constant T, constant P. Uh, let's do, um, let, let me erase that because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce these bit by bit. So my point there was just that we're going to really focus on delta G from now on. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about delta G and then we're in chapter 6. So let's do a constant T, not necessarily constant P. We'll do constant P in a little bit. Let's do constant T, and I want to know how, how G changes, right? Okay, so, um, so let's do DG, DP, at constant T. Okay, this term is gone, so I got V. All right, it's that simple. And let's see, that means that uh, if you want to integrate to get a finite delta G, you're integrating VDP. And this is going to be quite simple. If it's a gas, 
if it's a gas, then there you go. Then it's NRT over P, so that's the NR LNP up over PI. I'm not going to write that down because hopefully this is quite trivial at this point. And if you need to, if I ask a question about this, then I'll, I'll help you out. With the, anyway, I'll make it obvious. Okay, now we're also getting into things that are not necessarily gases. A lot of chemicals are liquids, right? Sometimes they're even solids. I mean, ge geochemistry. Chemistry of solids. I, I actually, if I had to do life over again, I'd be a lawyer to sue everyone. Uh, but aside from that, I actually probably would be a geologist because that's kind of neat. That chemicals, that solids can react with each other is, I think, kind of fascinating. Uh, so this could be the volume of a solid. And in which case, we don't think that the volume of the solid, it is pressure dependent. I mean, if you pressurize, you know, solids, they'll change their volume, but it's really, really small. So you don't need to worry about it. So if I'm talking about how G changes for a solid, I, it's the volume, we can just hold it constant. So this ends up being really quite easy. Now, why this is important is that when we do phase diagrams, you're going to need to use this a lot in phase diagrams. So don't, hopefully you're not memorizing any of this. Hopefully you, you know how to get here. If you know how to get here, stop trying to remember stuff. Stop trying to remember stuff and just be able to get here on your own because this, this again is just a bunch of middle school algebra. Uh, again, in phase diagrams, you're going to see this over and over again, so that's why I want to point it out to you now. Okay, now again, why is it all so useful? Um, maybe you're running a reactor and Okay, so this, this is true of both temperature and pressure. I'll, stick, I'll do pressure first. Maybe you want to change, all right, so, so you want, you've got a big reaction in the vessel and it's your first, you know, project with EOP, you're all engineers, and you're supposed to get a little higher yield out. Now here's the thing, so you want to, you want to make delta G more negative. That will create more products. You want it to be more negative. But does that mean you change the pressure up or down? Now the first thought might be, if you're really kind of into this, hopefully you're thinking like, well, but pressure has to be held constant, right? <laughs> temperature and pressure are held constant, so what the heck am I talking about changing pressure or temperature for that matter? Yes, delta G is relevant at constant temperature and pressure. More negative delta G is better. That's always better. You're doing this reaction for a reason. You want it to go. You don't mix things together for them not to react. That doesn't make sense. The more, ne the more negative delta G is, the better. Now, um, let me get into a little bit of weeds here. Technically, you're going you're gonna to adjust the delta G for products and reactants. So you'd have to adjust delta G for products, and then you, sub then you subtract from that the adjusted delta G for reactants if you change the pressure. So here's my point. You'll run reactions at constant temperature and pressure, but I never said what pressure. I never said what temperature. So here's the thing. You might get a more negative delta G at different pressures and temperatures. Once you figure out what those pressures and temperatures are, use them and keep them constant. But I never said that it necessarily had to be room temperature or pressure. Okay, now what I see here is that delta G goes up with pressure, right? Because volume is always constant. So if you want to raise the G, which is normally kind of bad, you would raise the pressure. The saving grace is that you're actually trying to optimize the G of products minus the G of reactants. I won't say anything more because we're going to do that um, actually Friday. Okay, anyway. Easy. This part's a nightmare. <laughs> okay. What's DGDT? And of course we'll hold, you know, if we hold, if we hold pressure, if we're changing pressure, we hold temperature constant. If we're changing temperature, we hold pressure constant. Okay, this ends up being kind of awful. Uh, not, not this part, this part's easy. Minus entropy. And we're going to talk about how you know what the absolute entropy of things are. Now that we're doing chemical reactions, we have to start thinking about the thing in the cylinder. Not just, it's just some perfect gas. We, we have to, we really, we can't work like that anymore. We have to know whether it's nitrogen or hydrogen. Um, sometimes that mattered before, but now it absolutely does. Okay, now entropy is always positive. Like all state variables, there, there's no such thing as negative entropy, um, especially in KLMW. It, or don't remember that, but anyway, um, there's no such thing as negative entropies. Uh, minus something always positive is always negative. So the G content of things go down with increasing temperature. 
Now remember, that doesn't mean that you always heat a reaction to make it go. You usually do, but not always. That's because if the gene content of um, reactants goes down more than products, you actually hurt, I have to think about it, you actually hurt yourself increasing temperature. Anyway, I'm going to get into that in a minute. Okay, anyway. Now, now before it, here, I'm integrating it, and there's really not much to do. If this is a gas, you know that volume is NRT over P, so it's not hard to integrate. If it's a liquid or a solid, liquids and solids are basically incompressible, so then you would treat it like a constant. So this is incredibly easy. This is not easy at all. Entropy is starkly temperature dependent. I mean, it's a, it has temperature in it. It's the change in heat over temperature. Temperature is terribly important to entropy. So we can't ever hold this as a constant if I want to integrate it. Okay, so let's try this. Uh, let's look at G. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute something in for entropy so that I get something that's integratable without blowing my head off. Right? As it stands right now, forget it. Don't, I, I can't integrate. I can't bring dt over and integrate it. I, I, the temperature dependence of entropy is very complicated. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute. S is always complicated. If I can put something else in its place, I'm okay. So that's what I'm going to try to do. Okay, so G is H minus TS. Therefore, G over T is equal to H over T uh, minus S. And therefore, uh, minus S is, um, let me give myself a G over T minus H over T. Okay, so let me, let me make sure that I do that right. Um, let's see, yeah, G over T, um, yeah, okay. So now what I can do is I can say DG, DT, again, I'm trying to get myself something that I can integrate, is G minus H over T, there's a common denominator. Uh-oh, uh-oh, I ran into a problem. Remember that if I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring dt over here, and that's great because I got t's on the right hand side. But if I've got g on the left, and I need the g's over there, g's over here, t's over here. But I can't. You can't algebraically remove g from this shockingly simple expression. This is the easiest thing in the world. But I can't bring the G on the left side, where it needs to be integrated. You know, if I bring the DT over here, I'm basically integrating 1 over T, which is natural law. And so that's easy. So I need the G over here. I mean, it looks like it's almost DG over G. It's almost, but not, not quite. It's, it's, again, it's algebraically intractable. So you got yourself an unfixable problem. You have no way to go forward uh, from here. Question? So it's not separable. Yeah, not the, yeah, the proper word is separable. Right. Some of those calc. Um, <laughs> oh God, when we when we do differential equations next semester, separable it just comes up all the time. By the way, it's a real nightmare. Um, well, we could take the derivative of it again and turn it into a linear. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's some math tricks. I mean, you can also do things like try to turn this into a Taylor series. There's all kinds of tricks. But for this class, we're going to actually just go a completely different route. This is kind of neat. What you do instead. Um, here, I guess I'll, I'll work from here. What you're going to do is call the Gibbs, Gibbs Helmholtz. Gibbs Helmholtz equation. Have you, have you covered this already? I, yeah, I see a lot of heads nod. Um, well, hopefully not total waste of time, but um, what you end up doing is there's two reasons for this. I am not going to worry about the change in G with respect to t, but the change in g over t with respect to t. Again, a constant pressure. I may occasionally forget that. The change in g over t, there's two reasons. One is that we're going to see g over t. We're gonna, you're going to see this thing pop up when we do phase transitions, like a gazillion times when we do freezing point depression of salt water. That equation, th this naturally pops up on its own. It's actually going to pop up like 20 times in the remainder of this class, so it's worth knowing on its own. The second reason is that if we're just trying to figure out whether G goes up or down with temperature, 
which is up in plus or minus, right? How many times have you heard me say that? Right? I just want to know whether G goes up or down. That's really all that matters. And so if I divide by T, T is always positive. So, so if I do this, and I can figure out whether the change in G, or T, G over T is positive, it's as good as knowing G by itself, because again, T is always positive. Okay, so, uh, and now let me solve this, and then it'll make more sense, hopefully. Uh, than trying to, you know, sometimes when I'm trying to say an equation, I know maybe that doesn't come out so well. All right, now, this first part always gives me a double take. Uh, every time I, I'm reviewing my notes before class, I always do a double take. What I keep forgetting is that uh, this is, a, basically this is, a, I have to use a product rule. I have to use a product rule on this. I, I know what the change in, um, we'll do it here, let me, let me back up. Okay, g over t. It's basically two functions with t in them because g is a function of t, which is why I'm doing the derivative to begin with. t is a function of t, it's t. All right, so the trick is to first, you let the first function stand on its own, and then you do the derivative of the other. And then you do the derivative of the guy that you left alone, and, um, and am I doing this right? And, um, and then you let the other guy alone. There you go. Now, the reason this works is g is a function of t as well. And let me uh, factor a t out, and that will be obvious why I do this in a, in a second. I gotta remember I'm at constant pressure. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't write that down a second ago. Okay, so there you go. Uh, what, 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 am I, am I off? Okay. Uh, it makes me nervous when I hear you chatter. Anyway, okay, nothing's wrong. Okay, now I'm still at the same, I still have the same problem. I have G's on the right and I have G over T on the left. I have G's on the right, G's on the left, G, I'm not getting anywhere. Anyway, <laughs> I'm quiet today, by the way, it's nerve wracking. Uh, <laughs> Okay, now I have to get rid of these G's, and I've got to put any, uh, anything else. Anything else will do. Now, it turns out, it turns out, look at this. I can actually go back to this guy, and I can see that dG over T, now, what I'm doing, by the way, I, I, I hate doing this. I've told you this a million times. I start on one derivation, I stop, I do another derivation, and then I go back to the first. I'm doing that again. I hate it when I do that, but I don't, well, but here we are. Well, let me get rid of this. I don't want you get, getting confused what I'm doing. I, want it. I don't want to get confused what I'm doing. There we go. All right, so what I did was I took our first derivation that stymied me and got me stuck because of algebraic um, lack of separability. And I see that what I've done is I got the same thing. I like little curly brackets, by the way. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it looks like, yeah, look at that, I got the same thing. So therefore, the g over t, changing t a constant p, is 1 over t times minus, uh, minus h over t, which is minus h over t squared. Okay. So there you go. A little complicated, and you know, you know, as I told you, I, I've always really hated doing a derivation, stopping to another one, another one, and then going back. It, it drives me nuts. Uh, and now, but but here you are. <laughs> I'm sorry. Not likely to ask you to like just rederive this on an exam because that's just memorization. If you don't remember to do what I just did, you'd be stuck forever. So I, I'm not going to ask you like derive this on an exam. That's ridiculous. Uh, but now let me show you a way that this more commonly appears. Uh, this actually requires more work than I can show. You can't just assume this. But what I'm doing is I'm, I'm inserting a delta G into the thing because again we're, we're really getting into reactions now that's the point of this is to start analyzing reactions 
So I'm putting in a delta G, and of course there's a delta H, because I want to start applying this to a reaction. And of course this will be products minus reactants, um, H of products minus H of reactants. So high school stuff, right? Uh, so there you go. All right, now, with that said, um, I've got a couple more minutes before we get into chapter six. Um, let me, um, yeah, let me work with this and I'll integrate it. We'll, we'll just touch on chapter six for a minute. So we are in chapter six. I would recommend reading it, chapter six, by the way. I worked, uh, that book, I spent one third of my time on chapter six because it's just that difficult to write. Um, but anyway, um, <laughs> I should talk about this. Okay, so, does G go up or down? Right, that's the point. Does, does increasing temperature drive G up or G down? And I would like it to go down. Now, before I was, I was yapping when I was here about you gotta be careful about products minus reactants, but in this case you don't. In this case you don't because I've written products minus reactants into the equation. Okay, so again, you've got, you've got you're at your first job at UOP, and you're asked to make more products, that does, as you're going to see, that does mean make delta G more negative. The more negative is, the, the higher the yield, that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between those. We're going to cover that. Okay, do you take the reactor and increase the temperature or not? Now this thing tells you. Now also, what I'm looking for here, is it plus or minus? And now you see why solving dG over T is fine, because T is always positive. So whether this is plus or minus, I can immediately tack that and just say, well, that's the delta G, because T, again, is always positive. OK, now, now that we're at constant pressure land, enthalpy is heat. So now I can use endothermic, and that means delta H. Again, because at constant pressure, H is, is heat. Endo and exothermic refer to heat transactions, not necessarily delta H, it depends whether pressure is constant. The pressure is constant, so it does refer to delta H. Delta H is plus or minus for endothermic. That's the one that gets cold, in case you forgot. I'm, hu I'm hugging it, hugging the magic cylinder, the magic reactor, and it's cold. Plus, what, plus or minus? Plus, it's plus. Okay. Okay, so dG over T, plus or minus? Minus. Minus. Okay. Temperature goes up, G goes down. Good or bad? Good. Good, right. All right, here's another way to, to see this. Endothermic reactions, it's like reactants. Um, I'll, I'll call it A. A goes to B, right? If you're endothermic, you can think of heat as a reactant. Uh, I like to use Le Chatelier's principle because you're really familiar with that from high school and freshman. If you're endothermic, you're using heat like a reactant. So if you drive the temperature up, you have to do that by adding heat. That's like adding reactants, you get more products. Right? It's a really easy way to remember that. If, um, maybe I'm going to have to ask a short answer. Oh, God, that'd be perfect. I put this on there and say, give me, um, explain in words what this means. And that, th this would be a perfect answer for that. Exothermic, the same thing in reverse. Right? Not, not hard. Ex uh, yeah, we we'll just do it, just for the hell of it. Um, because I really, I, I like the idea of doing this um, as a short answer. Okay, exothermic means heat is negative, and that means that heat is a product. Heat is a product, and if you flush the system with more products, equilibrium will shift to reactants. Right, Le Chatelier's principle. Um, so yeah, that's really about all I've got for this. Um, now there's another thing to note that, and this is going to come up a gazillion times, Maybe you don't need to write this down now. Uh, we're we're going to do it again later. But I just want to maybe flex some math muscles again because we're going to take a little bit of a break while we do Hess's Law stuff for a while. But this, remember I was saying the whole point of this is to integrate it. So let me do that. Uh, and just remind you what, um, remind you about how you split up. Now, now remember that you can't tell that pressure is constant. But, but you, you have to know that because you, you're deriving it based on a constant pressure equation. So just remember that. Uh, remember that the limits of integration here would be initial G over initial temperature. This is final delta G over final temperature. 
This is initial temperature and that's final temperature um, because you're changing temperature. So you, you'd have to know what the temperatures you're changing are. And let's see what you end up getting here. Um, I have to just, um, so what you end up with is delta G2 over, over your, you know, you know, so, okay, so you're at UOP and you're getting your first job and they say, hey, what do we, we need to change the reactor temperature, what temperature? You have to, you have to come up with something. I don't know, let's make it 100 degrees. Just come up with something, all right? That's 100 degrees. That's what you're looking for. Okay, now minus G1. Now this is, you already know this, by the way, because this is why, this is not good. This is, this is like positive, so that's bad. This is why you're doing this calculation to begin with. And um, then what you've got is the integral of one over t one over x squared. What's the integral? Minus one over x. All right. So, uh, the integral of one over x squared is minus one over x. We've already got a minus, so this ends up being this. Here's my curly bracket. Okay. So there you go. Now again, uh, you're going to see this a zillion times. But what I want to point out, though, is that I've actually made, wait, now, engineers, is this, is this what you've seen before? This, this, is this your guy that you, I, you're not saying anything? I, I saw, I literally saw this. <laughs> um, so there's a big approximation here, fairly, fairly substantial. Notice that I kept delta H, delta H. I didn't let it change with temperature. Is enthalpy temper uh, temperature dependent? Yeah. Right. Delta H is Cp delta T. Right. So if temperature is changing, this quantity is changing too. I'll have you maybe on a homework or a handout, I'll have you include that into, include temperature dependence to H. But I tell you, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's an algebraic nightmare. Uh, so I might, I might just do it as a handout. But anyway, so you're going to see this again. Okay, uh, last but not least, so that's really it for chapter five. Uh, and I'm kind of glad I'm stopping now because uh, chapter six is a bit of a bear. Uh, what I want to point out is what we're doing is we're going to calculate entropy of things, entropies of chemicals. Um, you know that these are tabulated in thermodynamic tables. When you look at a the thermodynamic table, you see enthalpy of formation, Gibbs energy of formation, you know, delta H, delta G, but you don't see delta S, you see the letter S. That is the absolute entropy content of those chemicals. And you do that by freezing something and then heating it up. And heating it up to room temperature um, in a calorimeter while monitoring the, the heat that goes into the system to calculate the, the entropy. Um, I'm going to stop here because I'm already over time. I'm going to stop here, but this is what we're going to do next time. So if you are reading the book, you are on chapter six now. At least the first maybe five or six pages, and that should be enough. Homework's Wednesday, and thank you for the candy picture again. All right, I'll see you all Wednesday.